Street Life Ministries is a Christ-following nonprofit that serves homeless folks on the Mid Peninsula. We meet really interesting people, and today we'd like to share one of those with you. Hi, everybody. I am here with a friend of mine, Frederick Walker, and we are going to hear an amazing testimony and story of my my brother right here that has just been transformed in many ways. So. Uh, before we go ahead and do that, let's just go ahead and uh, give this to the Lord, and then we'll get started. Uh, Heavenly Father, uh, thank you so much for um, just your new creation that you put in us, God, when we accept you, when we surrender our old ways to you, God. You're just a powerful, powerful God. Thank you, Lord, for the transformation that you have done in Frederick, uh, God, from taking Frederick from just the streets and homelessness and drug addiction to now saved and clean and sober and just doing the next right thing and just free and just with a beautiful smile on his face and just happy that his life is is turned around and changing um, leaps and bounds, God. Thank you, Lord, for, for navigating everything in Frederick's life, God. Just continue to be with him, watch over him, and continue to uh, just show him your will for his life and not his own, God. Let him lean on you and not himself, God. So I pray these things in your son's holiest name, in Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Awesome. Yeah. Like I said, man, I am so excited <laughs> to have you here. I Like I told you, I... There were some times where I just watched you struggle and I just, I, I wept because I didn't know if it was ever going to, I didn't know if this was ever going to happen. And I am, when I was told that from uh, Jesse Castro and a few of the other Redwood City police officers that you were in P90, and then I talked to Tom and Tom said that he was aware of it and that you were excited. I was just like, oh my gosh, this is so cool. And <laughs> It, it's amazing. I'm absolutely excited to have you here right now. So, thank you, David. Yeah. Um, so, give us a little. Give us a little history of who you are. Um, where were you born? Where were you raised? Um, childhood. Any anything that you feel that um, kind of just tells the story of, of who you are and what God has done in your life. How's that? You got it. Uh, thanks for having me, David. Appreciate it here. Um, beautiful prayer, also. Um, my name is Fred Walker. I'm. I'm Central was born in Daly City. Um, I, I uh, have an older brother, younger sister, raised by a single mother. Um, was uh, moved down to Foster City in 1988 and uh, just kind of got swept under the rug. My mom went through a divorce and such and um, just uh, I got swallowed up by the streets really, you know. My mom started kicking me out. Um, I was a juvenile delinquent. Um, and drugs were introduced to me at an early age, really. Um, I started really using about the age of 16 and such. And, uh, you know, I just uh, didn't know what to do, where to go. You know, life for me at this time was, was very confusing uh, because everybody in the streets and everybody, all my friends were using drugs. And so um, I thought that was the thing to do. Anyhow, um, from there, I just essentially met my wife. Uh, she was my girlfriend back at the time. We got together back in... Uh, August 19th of 88, August 19th of 1988 actually. And, um, you know, was with her for, for years and such. And we got married August 19th of 2000. And at that time we had one daughter. Uh, we conceived our middle daughter on our wedding night actually. And since then had another son. So three kids, two daughters and a son. And uh, they live in Foster City currently. So um, from there, um, using drugs and such uh, all throughout the time frame. Um, got my wife off drugs, actually. I, I cut her off uh, just because I didn't want my mother and my kids to be using, but unfortunately nobody was there to cut me off. And I continued using while she was basically being a good mom. Mm. And, um, you know, uh, introduced her to, to God at the time and my kids, uh, developed Bible studies with them. Um, but I just wasn't into it myself at the time. You know, it just... Too much of it was already instilled in me of the street life, the streets and such. And, and uh, I still had the same manner of direction that I had from being a teenager. I just had no wind in my sails to, to, to pull me to the right direction or area. Sure. So. so really quick, so let me, so you had Bible study with your kids. So you, you had a relationship with God. You knew God. I did. I and did. you instilled God into your children. Yes. And all along, you were just broken inside. Right. But also, but more important, believing in God. I, I had the faith through the whole time. I just was so lost and, and didn't know what to do because drugs had really grabbed a hold of me. Yeah. And uh, I was, yeah. uh, was pretty, uh, 
pretty desperate, really. Yeah. So when I first met you, you had said, I guess when you were married, you, you were a pretty pretty well-to-do car salesman or something, right? Yeah. So that was your that was your stick, right? That was my thing. I mean, I made over $100,000 in 2012 selling cars. Wow. I mean, I was, I was made 10 grand in a month five times in 2012. Wow. Yeah, I was a top-ranked salesman. Wow, that's pretty cool. Yeah. So, so tell me, or tell us, you know, me. <laughs> and there's an audience listening. Um, so, about when? How old were your kids? About how? About what time frame did you kind of spin out and then actually uh, leave your home environment? Let's see. So, I would say I was. Uh, my kids were. My oldest daughter was about t- mid twenties. Um, actually early twenties. Um, and it must've been 2014. It was basically, I was using drugs when I made a lot of money in 2012, 2013, uh, is when I really was, I think I was put out for the first time from my wife. So I made a, made the big money in 2012. The next year following we got evicted. I basically gave up my job because I just I got tired of chasing money. Yeah, and it was just too much of a struggle between keeping a marriage and the, my 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 drug life and and, and being a, a not not equipped enough of a husband to be able to uh, uh, lean back into the Bible and, and to gear things right with my wife. I just didn't have the you know the uh, the muster to do that to to get things solid with her. And so essentially, I was out on the streets of 2013. Um, my oldest daughter was in her early 20s. My middle daughter was, gosh, maybe 15, 14 at the time. And my son was about 12. Okay. Yeah. And then were you pretty much homeless just in Redwood City? Yeah. I mean, I spent a time in, in San Mateo, but Redwood City was pretty much, you know, out of five years, I was there pretty much for four and a half years of five years. You know. So so for those who will be watching and listening to this, there, there's a lot of people that are in recovery, there's people that are struggling in their addiction, and then there's people who listen and watch this podcast that are from the church, never never experienced homelessness, never experienced drug addiction. If you can, just kind of walk us through what it what is it like, or what was it like for you to be homeless, addicted to drugs? Obviously, it was meth, right? Correct. So, addicted to meth. So what? And knowing that you had a wife, knowing that you had kids. I mean, what was what was that like? I mean, what was the experience for you like? It was, it was horrible. I mean, myself, I came from Foster City, um, Foster City with, you know, three kids and wife. I was a soccer dad. And so next thing you know, I'm on the streets and um, I'm with, basically, uh, I'm around nothing but anarchy and, and, and disheveled people, um, predominantly mental, mentally ill. Um, and it was enough to drive somebody crazy, really, um, just because everything was not, there was no realness out there. Uh, there was no believers in God on the streets, and uh, everybody basically was had given up on their lives. Mm-hmm. And so me, um, wanting to stay in the upper echelon as far as not being the among the status quo that's robbing people and, and manipulations and such, uh, it really singled me out. And so it, I was basically put into a box because I wasn't of the same type of caliber uh, of, of the normal homeless. And so I was basically isolated, and so it caused me a lot more um, of loneliness being out there because I was different. Um, it was horrible. It was horrible, and it was a long five years out there in the streets. Um, you know. Yeah. So what? We'll, because um, we talked about this before we started recording, like, um, and you shared a little bit with me. So like the just the voices, right? I mean, like you you walk us through like um, being stuck, right? Mm-hmm. You know, because when I met you, right, like I told you, I, I mean, obviously, anybody who watches this or listens to this podcast, you, you, you're, you're very intelligent. You have an amazing, your, your, your speech is like impeccable. Like every, ever since the first time I met you and, and we started having conversations, like, I'm like thinking to myself, okay, I'm way below this guy's like IQ level. Because, I mean, you, you're very, you're very, very well spoken, very intelligent. So it's like, I just, you know, not to not to stereotype stereotype somebody who I that we work with that are homeless, but when I first met you and I heard you speak, I'm thinking, wait a minute, this guy doesn't so he doesn't fit in this in this this mold, <laughs> you know, and um and so I just knew I knew that there was something off, you know, and then you know as I know I'm I'm recovering an addict in meth addiction, so I know what it's like to get stuck. Yeah. Um, so where where was 
to walk us through like the last few, maybe the last week or last few days that got you to say, okay, I'm done. Well, I'll tell you, it was, uh, you know, during the past m- last month that I was on the streets, I've been telling myself that, you know, I wanted to get out of this, this situation. I just didn't know how to do it. You know, I, I, I had the wanting to want to get out, but I was stuck in this, this vicious groundhog day cycle of just getting up, using, wasting my days, just doing the same thing, but having this calling just to get out away from this. Um, everything was coming to, everything was gray to me. I, uh, I had no motivation to, I didn't, didn't know how to get out of the rut, the rut there. Um, I was afraid, really. I was, I was, I was scared because I didn't know what sobriety was going to look like, but I didn't have the muster enough to, to get up and do it. Um, I believe I, I actually caught in a, uh, got caught with, with some meth and paraphernalia, actually, on Valentine's Day. And I remember sitting there after the officer left and just sitting there where he left me and just disgusted. I was just disgusted and I was just extremely upset. And I was, couldn't believe the situation. Um, shortly after that, actually, I was behind the library, actually, and Officer Diana Rodriguez, the Redwood City PD, uh, she was, her and Castro were there, and I was, I was speaking to them, and I was telling them, I was crying out to them. I was in des- des- desperation, saying, I really want, I need to get out of here. I just don't know how to do it. I need your help. I, I really call, called out to them. And uh, um, it was so kind, because Diana Rodriguez, actually, at that time, she called Palm Avenue Detox, and... Um, she actually found out there was an opening the next day. So I, I was amazed and such. She told me what to do, go to the community hospital, take the test, and uh, I can get in. Um, at that point, there was no hesitation. I just jumped on it and did what I needed to do with a smile on my face the whole time. You know, I was like, this is my out. I saw the light there, David, I'll tell you. I saw the light and I was just like, because I knew at the time it was hard to even get into Palm Avenue and such, and there was just so many people trying to get in that I was like amazed that it, it opened up for me, you know? Um, and I just saw, I, I saw the way out and I just ran with it. I ran with it a hundred percent, hundred percent, hundred miles an hour and didn't even look back. That's cool. Yeah. That's really, really cool. Yeah. So with that, so how many, how many days sober do you have now? So today I have, let's see, this is my 82nd day today. 82nd day. 82nd day. So walk us through recovery. What has that been like for you? Recovery was... It was really a look at myself, you know, recovery. I started off at Palm Avenue. I was there for 11 days. Then I went to P90, Project 90 there in San Mateo. Um, there was a counselor there that told me, Fred, we really want you to be the best person you can be. And that, that entails you being the best person you can be at every step of the way, at every time. And that rang loud to me, David, you know. So I used that, that what he told me there. And I decided at that point to be the best I can be at every step of the way to utilize every time I had to basically work on myself. Mm. Um, I described myself at, at like this. I, I use the metaphor of two birds in a tree, okay? So you have my spotlight bird, which is the bird that's basically doing the errands and such and goes about the day and goes to the meetings. But the floodlight bird is the spiritual bird side that's sitting there and not doing anything, but just looking and observing everything, mm-hmm. but really looking on the inside. Hmm. And that floodlight bird, which is my second spiritual bird, just sat there and just basically just looked at everything and really looked inside deep and um, became aware of things and, and the things that were important, things that would actually allow me to be a better person. Uh, my acceptance, my patience, my tolerance, my, my compassion. And all that, with the help of God and grace, grew me from the inside. It grew and it allowed me to, to deal with the things I needed to deal with, you know, um, to learn how to be a better person in such a short amount of time, to, to handle the things I needed to. Because even in, 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 in the recovery home, I had people in there that weren't really wanting recovery, and mm-hmm. they were really, we want to say, dry drunks, so to say. Sure. And they had personality issues. And so even though I put myself away from the people in the streets, which was a huge part of me wanting to leave, but I put myself still in small surroundings with people that weren't necessarily the most graceful. And so I essentially... Um, honed in on the word acceptance and such and really dug in deep and allowed me to actually transform myself. And uh, it was so great that P90 recognizes that, recognizes actually and, and actually allowed me to transfer homes to the Carner home, which is given for people that they trust and that have a strong program, you know, and it just really developed me as a person. So the spotlight bird really took care of the things I needed to do, getting my ID, uh, making the calls to get my therapist, getting the uh, sponsor, getting my home group established, working on the steps. And the floodlight bird really just dug in deep and allowed me to see everything as, as in a whole without mm. moving and being by being still. Mm. So, That's awesome. Yeah. That's awesome. And how is your relationship with God today? 
Wonderful. My release of God is, is, you know, there's something to be said to be able to go to sleep with peace and to wake up happy. Yeah. You know, yeah. uh, happy, joyous, and free, as they say in, in AA. And I, I, I can understand the true meaning of that now. Right on. You know, everything is great. You know, there's no, no, no bad points in my life right now. Yeah, by the and, grace of God. and like you were telling me before, like your relationship with your wife is getting better. Oh, it's it's, we're joking and laughing like like we were in high school. You know, that's awesome. <laughs> I've been with her since I was fifteen. She was fourteen. You know, we're like two peas in a pod. And and uh, the great thing about it is, you know, I'm not forcing myself on her. You know, right? It's like you know, she allowed me to, the the opportunity to kind of touch down with her and such to just be in a transitioning stage of my life. But I'm not because of the floodlight bird. I'm not trying to manipulate my way into her life because that should come naturally, you know. Sure. We know what it is. We, we basically accepting some of that. We're accepting of this. And we're basically just taking that friendship standpoint and giving, yeah. it, giving it time and relationship to see whatever blossoms or blooms from this point. That's awesome. Yeah. And then your kids are accepting? Oh, the kids are great. Yeah, they're accepting. Um, you know, I, I'm trying not to insert myself too much in their lives. You know, I, of course, I want to be that dad that's, hey, you know, clean up your mess and such. But, you know. For me, the most important thing for me to do right now is really hone in on myself and just to be sure. who I am and, and to learn who I am. And and, uh, and that's what I'm doing right now. You sound very comfortable in your own skin now. I am. You weren't before. No, not at all. I uh, you, were wa you walked around like I could tell you're like a very uncomfortable person. Yes. And you seem so sure of yourself today. It's I, I'm blown away by your smile just the, you, I can see the light of Christ coming off of you thank you David I mean it's I'm just in awe right now because I, I like seriously like I, I've known you for a while yes, you have, David. and uh, it's there were some those five years were dark yes and yes. so and seeing you and the smile on your face and just the shine that comes off your forehead is just like wow <laughs> that's cool you know you know it's interesting like you know when somebody's been touched yeah. by the Holy Spirit yeah. and I and I can see that I can see that you're yeah, I see that you're on a good path. You know, I know that Tom has talked to me uh, several times, but, you know, you've been meeting every Wednesday with Tom, and yeah. he's told me that, yeah, you're the real deal, that it's, you know, you, you know, it's, you know I, I'm not trying to uh, be negative, but there's definitely people who I've met that are that get in recovery, and you you could just tell that, um, you know, the expression, I'm going to fake it till I make it. Yeah. And you could just tell that they're they're just... I don't. I don't tell them that they're going to fail, but I, I can see a relapse coming. Yeah. And then three, four, five, whatever months later, I hear that they're back out, and I'm like, yeah. And in my mind, you know, I don't. I keep it to myself, but it, you know, in my mind, I'm thinking, yeah, I kind of saw that coming. Yeah. And and then I see guys like you, and I hear you talk, and I'm thinking, okay, they're like Tom. I'm telling you, when I met Tom, Tom was five or six years struggling. And when he when he quit and he get, went to Salvation, I mean to City Team, yeah. and uh, I saw him like about two months after he went there, and I knew I'm like, okay, he's never going back. Yeah. And now he's, I mean, he's doing great. He's married, and you know, so it's awesome. Yeah. So for those who will watch this or listen to this, um, I have an amazing uh, following of people that will pray for you. Thank you. Tom. Is there anything you, anything Tom. specific that you want people to know that they should be praying about? You know, I think of this about a quote I just uh, just obtained and, and, and stuck with me. It says, uh, "Don't let your calling take you where your character can't keep you." Anybody can have anything, but I'm I want to keep this. I want to keep this 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 feeling of contentment and, and joy. So, if you can have people pray for me, just to remain humble and to remain uh, loyal to to God mm -hmm. and to you know have Him first in my life. Um, I know everything will be fine. So I just want to—I want to be on the straight and middle path. I don't want to be up here in the, in the up in the high horse. I don't want to be in the low horse. I want to be right in the middle because that's consistency. And I want to be in this for the long term for the rest of my life. Um, so yeah. So if you can just pray for endurance, really. Yeah, endurance, long time recovery. That's right. Right, and I want to uh, also say pray for you and the transition of your family, your wife, your kids. If that continues to unfold in a good way yes um and that um that transition is continuing to be uh, accepting yes. from your kids and kids are pretty resilient i think as adults husband and wives we can be a little bit we're a little bit more older and jaded yeah kids can be pretty resilient but i i it sounds to me like that there's a lot of recovery going on there so i'll just pray for the family to continue to keep coming together yes. i think it's awesome i think it's great that the, that their kids got their dad back yes 
I think it's great that your wife and you are, are working on that friendship. Yes. You know, and like, like you said, just go slow. Focus on you. That's right. And let God take care of the rest, right? That's right. So I heard a wonderful uh, uh, description the other, the other day at, at one of the meetings. He said, the difference between belief and faith. The difference between belief. So belief is basically knowing that God can take that wheelbarrow and push it across a tightrope. But faith is actually jumping in that wheelbarrow. And, yeah. and so that, that's where my life is right now. I have faith. And I, I, I may not know what tomorrow is going to hold, but my hand's off the steering wheel, and I have faith that God's going to push you through. So. Sure. And you know, one of the things I can tell by talking to you that I also, um, um, I know when I, one of my radars to know when I see somebody that's going in the right direction is um, you're not playing a victim card. You know what I mean? You, you just, I'm taking care of me. I'm working on my stuff, and 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 that when I hear stuff like that, I go, okay, there's a man, or even a woman. When I hear, see a woman doing it, I go, there's a person that's working on their recovery, and they're not blaming anybody else for it. I'm working on my stuff, and that's that means a lot because I I'm, I myself I, I in the beginning, I mean, it was everybody else's, it was everybody else's fault <laughs> for my for my addiction <laughs> until I realized that all the fingers pointed at myself, right? Yeah, and then I was right. like, okay, the, the only way I'm going to stay sober is if I realize it's me. That's right. So, that's right. cool. Thank you, Fred. Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate it. David. It's a joy seeing you, and I'm pleasure. glad you graduated from uh, P90. Yes, sir. And, uh, yeah, man, i be praying for you and wishing you good luck. Thank you so much. All right, man. Yes. God bless you, brother. And you as well, David. All right, man. Thank Bye. you.